Alright, continuing with this series of videos examining some of the physics taught in university as uh, the truth. <laughs> yeah. And questioning whether it's actually an accurate description of uh, what actually happens and such. So we have covered RC circuits and our L circuits, and today we will spend the entire lecture on L, R, C circuits. We'll only discuss them in series, so that you get the basic idea. I have here a driving power supply, alternating, and here I have a capacitor, C, self inductor, L, and resistance R. This is AC and that the driving voltage be V0. So if memory serves me, this is the push-pull kind of idea. That um, uh, <laughs> when one's on, the other's off kind of thing. And they end up, um, um, yes, the push-pulling on each other, so to speak. Cosine omega t. We have to set up the differential equation for this, and I want to remind you that Kirchhoff's loop rule does not hold. So the closed loop integral of e dot dl, in spite of what the author of your book wants you to believe, that is not zero. All right. So he says that, but then it's it is does it does work out the same. So again, it's he says it, but it's not true. So how do we? Set it up. There are various ways that you can do that. I have my own discipline. I, in my, I think of this first being a, a battery. By this is the plus side, and this is the minus side. The current is going to flow. So again, it, it, the loop rule holds as long as you do exactly what he just did, which is you just take the alternating current and you take its two phases, and understand what happens on the first phase, and then understand what happens on the down phase, the reverse phase. The capacitor is going to charge up. The electric field inside the capacitor is in this direction. The electric field in the self inductor is always zero because the self inductor has no resistance. There's no electric field inside the self inductor, no matter what some of your books want you to believe. Okay, so the truth is, though, the self inductor acts as a resistor. So to say there's no resistance in the coil is kind of uh, pointless because it does in fact act as a resistor in the sense that it will take a very long time it can take a very long time for the current to move through the coil very long time then the electric field in the resistor is in this direction and the electric field inside the power supply goes from plus to minus would be in this direction so if I set up the differential equation I start here I always go in the same direction as I, because only then is the closed loop integral minus L the IDT. So I go over this capacitor, that is V of C, then I go through the wire of the self inductor. There is no... So he only goes in the direction of the current because they have established that the current goes in the direction of the plus side to the minus side, which makes all the plus and minus signs work out. So if you follow the current, then the plus and the minus are kind of stay consistent. But obviously the plus and minus is a lie in the sense that the minus is the side that has the higher potential and the potential moves the other way around. It goes from high pressure to low pressure. Electric field, so the integral E dot DL there is zero. Then I go through the resistor, so I get IR. And then I have here my power supply, so I get minus V0 cosine omega T. And that now, according to Faraday's law, equals L minus L the IDT. The current equals the QDT. If the current is positive, this is my positive direction, then the charge of the capacitor will increase. And I also know that V of C, the potential difference over the capacitor, is the charge on each one of the capacitor plates divided by C. And so I substitute that in this equation, and I bring the L, the IDT to the left side. That is conventionally done. You don't have to do that, but that's often done. So I get a plus L. The IDT now becomes D2QDT squared. 
my goal is to get everything in terms of Q, then my IR becomes R times dQ dt, and my V of C, which is now the battery. Um, so, but again, doing the self-inductance is zero, doesn't really work because as the capacitor is charging, it has to go through the self-inductor. It has to go through the inductor, and um, that will take time. V comes Q divided by C. Notice that I ranked it in order D2 Q D T squared, D Q D T, and then Q. You don't have to do that, but there's nothing wrong with doing that. And then we get here equals V0 cosine omega T. And this is the form in which most books would present this differential equation. And they arrive at in various ways. Most books arrive at this equation in a completely wrong way, but they get anyhow, they end up with this equation. And so you'll have to solve this equation, which is really beyond your present abilities. It's second order differential equation. It's really part of 1803. So I will give you the solution. The basic idea being that you find a solution for Q as a function of time. And once you know Q as a function of time, you have, of course, the current, because then you take the derivative of your solution and you get the current. I will give you the current as a function of time. So I, that satisfies that differential equation, is the V0 divided by R squared plus omega L minus 1 over omega C squared, and the whole thing times cosine omega T minus phi. And the tangent of phi equals omega L minus 1 over omega C divided by R. I think that whole function is a tiny influence on the whole equation. So the real guts of the matter um, is going to be the time element of the inductor, and how long it takes the inductor to charge, essentially, like the capacitor. So it's almost like having two capacitors in a system. The inductor is going to absorb energy as it um, as it fills, <laughs> and um, so it won't get to the capacitor. The capacitor is going to keep saying, "I need more stuff. I need more stuff," and it has to go through the inductor until the inductor is charged. The capacitor is going to uh, very slowly charge. We give this upstairs here a name. We call that the reactants. The reactants. And that x, or sometimes it's called psi, is omega L minus 1 over omega C. And the units I also owns. We call the entire square root. So, and so the ohms of this reactance is essentially, again, putting resistance into the inductor. So that's the only element here that that can come from in realistically. Um, he's saying it's the, the battery's problem. It's not the battery's problem. It's the inductor's problem. That you see here, we call that capital Z, which is called the impedance. So the square root of R squared plus that X squared equals Z. That also has units of ohm, and that is called the impedance. And so Z is an effective resistance. Right. So uh, where he said before, uh, there's no resistance in the inductor. It's an effective resistance. The impedance is resistance. So because this whole thing behaves like a resistance, but the resistance depends not only on R, L, and C, but also on the values of omega. This solution is what we call a steady state solution. It is the solution that you get if you wait a certain amount of time. If you turn the instrument on, so you all of a sudden start this experiment, then in the beginning you get a different solution which is more complicated. You get transient phenomenon, but these transient phenomenon die out, and you end up with this solution. Now there are several interesting things that you can see in this solution. We have to start digesting this whole hour, this solution. It's very interesting aspects. For one thing, you can see that the current can be delayed over the driving voltage when phi is positive. Then the current comes later than the voltage. And that's the result of the inductor. We've discussed that before. But now that's also possible that the current is leading the voltage, which is very hard to understand intuitively. That is the case when this term dominates over this one, then phi becomes negative, 
and so minus phi becomes positive. If minus phi is positive, the current is leading the voltage. I think it will eventually get to a hysteresis here of, <clears throat> you know, but there's no, there's no current leading anything. There's just the residual effect of when you were pushing, and then when you start to pull, you have to undo. So it's a bunch of deceleration. You can think of it as first you have to decelerate everything before you can start to accelerate in the new direction. So um, I think that's... Now you may say, how can it possibly be? Does it mean that before I switch the instrument on, that I already have a current? Of course it doesn't mean that. But that's the transient solution, remember? When you turn something on, when you switch it on, this solution doesn't hold yet. This is the steady state solution. So the value... <clears throat> but the steady state solution is still... The problem is, is that you're switching the steady state. So the steady state is never staying in one state. So it won't be. It's always recovering from being in another state. So it'll be a steady state the solution, but that's just an averaging of the effects of turning it on and off. It's an average state solution. For I max, we've always called what is in front of the cosine term, we've always called that I max. That value for I max is a function of omega itself, as we will analyze in detail today, and of course also of R, L, and C. And there is one particular value for Z, and therefore for omega, whereby this value reaches a maximum. And that's what we call resonance. There is no value for omega for which the current is any higher. And so I will call here. So that would be the perfect frequency for the two the, the two items you have tied together to the capacitor and the inductor have a, um, a relationship that um, is in such a way that the capacitor can charge in the amount of time it takes the inductor to charge and so the two have a symmetry about them so that there's a you can get more out of the system and any absence of symmetry means something has to be underdone that is the capacitor doesn't have enough time to charge or the inductor um, doesn't charge fully either um, in one direction it, the change happens before the steady state is reached so the ideal is to have the change happen at a rate where the steady state is achieved by both the capacitor and the inductor. The situation at resonance it is at resonance when x equals zero, so when omega L is one over omega C, so when omega is one over the square root of LC. And we call that the resonance frequency, and we often give a little subscript zero there to remind you that you deal with the resonance frequency. And Z is then just R, because when x is zero, the omega L and the one over omega C eat each other up. They are not there anymore. It's gone. And so the system behaves as if they were only a resistor. And so you also see that the maximum current that you get is then simply V0 divided by that value for R, because Z, the impedance, is now R. And in addition, if you're interested in phi, phi then becomes zero. So the driving voltage is then in phase with the current that follows. And so the signal that you will see is a cosinusoidal variation in the current. So if I have here the current as a function of time, then you get a signal like so. And this here, this period t, equals your 2 pi divided by omega. So that is the directly connected to your driving frequency. And if the impedance z is very low, then this maximum value of the current, this is what we call the maximum value, and of course the maximum value is also here, except that the cosine is minus 1 here. The co It'll be achieved quickly. And if the impedance is high, then it will take a long time to achieve that maximum. Think. Cosine is plus 1 here. So if z is very low, then this will be high. If z is very high, this will be low. And there is only one and one value of z for which the system is at resonance, and that is when the self-inductance and the capacitor eat each other up, and then you get the maximum possible value for the current at maximum, which is V0 over R. And that's the highest value that you could ever get then.
<clears throat> I guess that would be when uh, the capacitor is charging while the inductor is full and then the in, the inductor drains into the capacitor and so then the inductor keeps pulling current to refill and then the capacitor goes empty while the inductor is filling yeah so it just so it's always pulling current imagine that we have an LRC circuit and we have L and R and C fixed but we change the driving frequency so we move over various values of Z by changing omega from a very low value to a very high value if you start at a very low value for omega let's say it approaches zero then notice that Z goes to infinity and so the maximum current becomes zero I wonder why they're using omega for the frequency when they use uh, that other symbol usually for frequency, <laughs> but whatever. And the person responsible for that is the capacitor. Because if omega goes to zero, this goes to infinity. And that's intuitively pleasing. Because omega zero really means you have no AC anymore, you have DC. And with DC, what you're doing is you charge up the capacitor when it's fully charged, no current can flow anymore. So that's intuitively pleasing. When omega becomes very high, let's call it infinity, then Z again goes to infinity. So again, the maximum current again goes to zero. And the person responsible for that is the self-inductor. Because when omega goes to infinity, again Z goes to infinity. So again, you get zero here. And that's also intuitively pleasing. Because if you have an infinitely high frequency, that means the self-inductance puts up an enormous fight. It's I well, it's always fighting. So this is this, this, the self-inductor is charging you know, one way, um, north, positive, whatever, inside. And then the current switches and then it drains. You know, it has to drain what it has inside of it to put the new stuff inside of it, so to speak. And so, um, yeah, it's probably enough of a statement. And all that takes time. Deal for a self-inductor to fight currents if the time over which the changes occur go to zero. And so then again, it says, sorry, you can't have any current. So that's also intuitively pleasing, that the self-induction then becomes the dominant factor. And so what I can do now, I can plot the IMAX as a function of omega. I guess you could sort of think about it as the one lead from the capacitor and the other lead to the um, um, inductor just keep switching the same current back and forth to each other out of phase. <laughs> so um yeah it's probably as good a way of saying it as other it's like never change it never gets any current from the, you know it's it's just the same stuff just going back and forth between the two it charges the plate on the capacitor and then it takes that charge and puts it back into the inductor so here is omega and here is imax and we already agreed that when omega is zero, then IMAX is zero. But when omega is very high, it's also zero. So I think this will be the hysteresis curve. So it'll go the funny way. When omega is at resonance, omega zero, which is one over the square root of LC, notice that R has nothing to do with the resonance frequency. It's really determined by L and C. Because it's the psi, it is the x that you want to make zero. And x is only a function of L and C. At this frequency, we have a value here, which is V0 divided by R. And so the curve that you're going to see, which we call the resonance curve, is something like this. Oh. You start out with an extremely small current, you go through resonance, we have a high current, and then at high frequencies, again, you go down to zero. And so, so this is for a variable frequency, which, you know, isn't that interesting. The left part, when you are below resonance, is really the capacitance, which is the dominant guy in the whole game. And phi, by the way, is here less than zero. Here it is the inductor that plays the key role. And here phi equals larger than zero. And right here, phi, and only there, phi is zero. Only when you're exactly at resonance. I'd like to show you some numerical 
results. And for that, I have a transparency. It's also on the web, so you don't have to copy the numbers. Uh, you can download them. Here are just some numerical numbers, which I want to digest with you, so that you get a feeling for the effect, that you see it in front of your own eyes, what is happening, how this curve evolves. We have here, given our L and C, 10, 5 times 10 to the minus 2 Henry and 3 times 10 to the minus 7 Farad. The resonance frequency is a little over 8,000 radians per second. You see it here in kilohertz, and you see here the impedance. And what I do here, I have a driving frequency, which is 10% below the resonance frequency. And I calculate for you the omega L, which is 367 ohms, and 1 over omega C, which is 453 ohms. You are a little bit below resonance, and so C dominates. And you can see, indeed, that this ohm value is larger than this one. And so out of that pops a value for X, out of that pops a value for Z. Notice that X is 86, and Z is only a hair larger than 86, because this R almost doesn't add to Z, because you get here the square root of 10 squared plus 86 squared, and it's almost 86, it becomes 87. And then you see that the current, the maximum current... Sorry, I couldn't really follow the chart, which one is which and which category is switching, so can't really say much about it. Obviously, you increase the inductance, then it's... It's going to only work at slow frequencies. Huh, go yeah. ahead. Which is this value for V0 divided by uh, the Z, by 87, becomes 0.11 amperes. And now the system is driven at resonance, and notice that it's exactly characteristic for resonance that omega L and 1 over omega C have the same value. They are not there anymore, they're gone. And so X becomes 0, so the impedance becomes O. Right, so the capacitor and the inductor have the same timing to charge and that ends up equaling zero which means you'll have the maximum that's the they're well paired 10 ohms which is the resistance and so the maximum current is now v0 divided by r which is one ampere and when you're 10 percent over resonance then the self-inductor becomes to be more powerful than the capacitor and again your current is substantial so you can see it's a big difference so that's the important point is just being a little bit off resonance will substantially impede the function of getting current from the battery to go through the system. Now, there'll be lots of stuff going back and forth between the inductor and the capacitor, but, uh, you know, and that's just noise between those two, but you won't be driving much current. So you really have to be on residence to be able to drive current. But obviously there'd be circumstances where you want it not to have any current because you want to kill certain frequencies. In this case, eight times lower than at resonance. We define at a height of 0.7 times the value at resonance, we define a width of this curve. And this width is given in terms of delta omega. And that width, and I will give you the answer without mathematical proof, it's not so difficult, but it's a little bit of a headache. That value is r divided by l. So the larger r is, the broader it becomes. So if we look at delta omega for the numbers that we have there. So uh, the value of r decides the, how many bands of frequency uh, would be the tolerance of this if it used as a filter. The numbers of the transparency. So this is for, for the numbers that we have there. We have delta omega would be r, which is 10 ohms, divided by 5 times 10 to the minus 2. And that is about 200 radians per second. We define Q, not as charge, don't never confuse that with charge, we call it the quality of the resonance, and the quality is defined as omega zero divided by delta omega. Now omega zero itself is one over the square root of LC, and delta omega is R divided by L. Right, so the quality of the resonance would be how fine, you know, how much that peak is narrowed. 
And so that makes the quality 1 over R times the square root of L over C. And the quality is a measure for omega 0, which is this, what I'm pointing at now, divided by delta omega, which is this. So if the quality is high, this peak is relatively narrow, and if the quality is low, it's relatively wide. You may ask yourself the question, why do we define delta omega at 70% of the maximum current at resonance? Why not at half? There's a good reason for that, because in practice, we are more interested in power than that we are in currents. And power is proportional with I squared. And so when you square this, you get 0.5. And 0.5 means then that this is really the width at half power. And so that's the reason why we chose the 0.7 times the maximum current at resonance. It's really the half power width. Resonance can be destructive. Uh, imagine if you... It's still arbitrary how you choose to measure the width because it's always going to be proportional. If you even you measure it a quarter power, you're still going to get a proportional relationship. So probably doesn't matter. You have a very high Q system. If you slightly off resonance, there's almost no current, no power dissipated in your resistor. And now you come all of a sudden on resonance, you get an enormous current. And that means there's an enormous power dissipation in your resistor and you can burn out your resistor. You can destroy your circuits if you're not careful. And next lecture and Monday, I will also discuss with you uh, some me mechanical resonances. Mechanical systems can also go into, they can also be destructive. At certain frequencies, the systems behave, call it violently, they respond extremely strongly to their input frequency and things can break. Human. This meaning that uh, <coughs> you can put too much current through the small wires of the inductor or something, burn the inductor out, something like that, I guess. These have also resonance frequencies. You can call them, if you want, emotional resonances. All have sensitive nerves. Someone makes a particular remark, go through the roof. Yes, uh, example being someone challenges <laughs> the idea that it can be two voltages in one place. Certain people have to start insulting people. Also, falling in love, when you think about it, is a resonance phenomenon. And that, too, can be rather destructive. As many of us know. Yeah, it's not really a physics kind of statement. But now I would like to demonstrate to you the resonance curves. I'm going to choose particular values of um, R, L, and C, which I can change. And then I will show you the current as a function of frequency. And these are the values that I have chosen. Again, this is on the web. You can download it, so you don't have to copy it now. And I will change the, the light setting so that we can also enjoy the demonstration. The idea being that for these... All right, so resistance uh, and Henry's for the inductance and Farad's for the capacitor. So the resistor was all the same here. Uh, well, these aren't substantially different numbers, so it's not all that interesting. Values that I have there, in the first line, you see R, 60 ohms. And the self-inductance is uh, 50 millihenry, and the capacitance is 0.3 microfarads. So that's a given there. And I give you here the resonance frequency, 8,000, in terms of omega, radians per second. This is the resonance frequency in hertz. And just in case you're interested, I give you the Q value there as well. And what I'm going to do now for you is I'm going to sweep the input frequency from 0 to 16,000 radians per second. So my omega can go from 0 to 16,000. And I leave the values as they are here. So I'm going to sweep, sweep over this 8,000. And so you're going to see that curve, except that I'm, show, I'm going to show you I as a function of frequency, not I max. And I is oscillating because there's a cosine term. And so, for instance, if I were here with this value for omega, you would see then that it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, and it goes down. And when I'm here, you will see this. And keep that in mind when you look at the curve that you're going to see there. And so it's only the envelope then that is the I max. But you actually see the entire current as a function of frequency. And I'm going to do that then for all these four values that you see there. So let's first change the light so that we get an optimum situation for you. And now I will 
show you already the results of the first line. So these are the values that you see there. And I go, I st I go very slowly. Now omega is zero here. Omega goes up. I go through resonance. And omega is here, the value of the 16,000 radians per second that we have here. And it sweeps back and forth between zero and 16,000. So you see a dramatic increase at resonance. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to double the self-inductance. And when you double the self-inductance, this one goes up, omega zero goes down. So all I want you to see that the resonance frequency, which is here, that's the maximum, that the resonance frequency will shift. Because if L goes up by a factor of two, the resonance frequency will come down by the square root of two. And so I am going to increase L by a factor of two. I'm going to make sure that I have the right knob here. And this is my L. And notice that the, the resonance frequency is now the lower value. It is here. Also notice that the peak value at resonance has not changed. Because the peak value at resonance, you see on the blackboard here, is V0 over R. So as long as I don't change R, that doesn't change. It's only the... So changing the inductor um, can create a more dramatic difference between the mean value and the peak value which is supposed to be the resistor's job, so I really don't, you know, didn't entirely follow that one. The frequency that changes. Omega zero is one over the square root of LC. That changes. It's now here. So I have increased L by a factor of two. All right, so the big peak comes earlier. It was right in the middle, and then it comes earlier. But it does seem like this. the rest of the peaks are lower than they were before, but apparently they're not, so... I can bring it back to my original resonance frequency by now changing C. If you increase L by a factor of 2, all you have to do is decrease C by a factor of 2, and you're back at the same resonance. So I'm going to make C down, C lower by a factor of 2, which I'm doing now. And if you look now here and you have a good memory, you will see that the resonance frequency is back where it was. The middle. And V0 over R is not changed, and the resonance frequency is back here, even though L is now twice higher and C is twice lower. To show you the effect of R, I will double R now, and I will leave everything else alone. So the rest. So now the peak should be very small, which is quick. Certain frequency will stay here, but of course the maximum current, this high value, will now come down, because you see, at resonance, this value is V0 divided by R, and since R goes up by a factor of two, you will see that the maximum current will go down by a factor of two, and so I go now from. 60, from 50, or I go from 60 to 100. I don't double it. I can't go any further than 100. But you see a substantial reduction. So if you're ready for this, remember this height. And now you see 100 ohms, and it is much lower. It was this height before, and now it's only here. But notice the resonance frequency has not changed. So this is an extremely interesting behavior. <coughs> and every time you have to think through what is happening, you have not much intuition for it. You're not alone. I don't have much intuition for that either. But okay, so I guess we'll end here um, and hope for better for the next <laughs> bit. But uh, you know, it's all part of the subject. Um, uh, conceptually, it'd be better if there was more discussion about what's actually taking place, which is the the capacitor has a gap between it, you know, and the inductor is creating a uh, field inside the wire and that field takes time to not only be created in the sense that when, it, when you start creating the field in the inductor so when electricity is going through it a, a pressure a pressure up or pressure down um, what's happening is is that it's going to consistent with that pressure create a field inside that's going to be reflecting and as that field is created at magnetism it pre-magnetizes the wires ahead of the, the movement of the current so as the currents moving the magnetic field is affecting the wires ahead of it not only creating this resource but affecting the wires ahead of it essentially pre-pressurizing them which means they can't transmit pressure as efficiently so that's what's turning it into a resistor um, and the capacitor has big plates and it takes time to fill the big plates so those are the two time issues 
that are in competition. The time it takes for the current to push through the self-magnetism created inside the adductor and the time it takes to fill the entire plate with either positive or negative charge. Right, that's enough. So, till oh, what the hell happened there? Well, that's quite disappointing. Why, why, why did that happen? What did I do? Oh, okay. Somehow I moved it down for some reason, which I have no idea why I would have done that. <laughs> so, I don't know off the top of my head, but at least the whole video wasn't like that. Anyway, till next time. And such.